We're going to be covering our scale and proportion positive and negative relationship lecture, specifically sort of dealing with the ink wash landscape. For our learning objectives, students will identify what is atmospheric perspective, positive and negative space, and gradation. Students will create their own ink wash drawings inspired by nature, focusing on value to develop their forms and atmospheric perspective. Grading criteria will be within the accuracy in highlights and shadows using ink wash and water, composition showing unique creativity from each landscape and overall craftsmanship. Throughout the lecture, we'll start to see some artist local references, talk a little bit about what is a landscape, what is plain air, how do we make value, how do we make gradations, so the use of light, but also sort of the use of positive and negative space. For our materials that we're going to be using, again, we have our 18 by 14 excuse me, 14 by 17 Strathmore paper or 18 by 24 uh, larger scale paper. We'll leave that up to you, which one you want to use. We have our Sumi and India inks, which I'll go over in the demo to talk a little bit about what the differences for both India inks as well as Sumi are. Painter's tape, brown hair Sumi brush, and a bamboo pen. Now, the bamboo pen is going to be optional. You are not required to purchase a bamboo pen, but I will sort of kind of go over that a little bit later on today. Up to three to five cups or containers of water as well as our ruler, and finally, a roll, ideally, of paper towels. And the reason why we like to use paper towels is because, and remember, because we're working with water, if we make any spills, if we make any mistakes, we want the easy access of uh, the paper towels to quickly catch, but also sort of absorb all of the excess water or ink that we spill. I would highly recommend everybody work on a flat table you do not want to fight with gravity. So if you're working on an easel or on a wall, please be careful because if you add too much water or ink, it will fall. So you don't want, you don't want to fight with gravity. Okay. And mainly, I mean, I want everybody to sort of also have enough uh, space. So really, when you're taping, we'll talk a little bit about this more in the demo, when you're sort of grounding and sort of taping your table or your sheet of uh, paper on your table or on your counter, where, where have you, um, be mindful not to remove that off of that surface. And we'll talk a little bit about why you should do that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about plain air. So plain air approach was pioneered by John Constable, but from about 1860, it became fundamental to Impressionism. The French term plain air means out of doors and refers to the practice of painting entire finished pictures out of doors. What this means is sort of looking at the physical space not only intuitively, but from the actual environment. You artists from the past, but also sort of artist local references from what we're gonna be looking at from uh, the lecture, um, are examples of where artists actually would go to these site-specific locations and directly paint or draw from observation. Obviously cameras were not invented during these times. So this is where artists are using visual perception to sort of dictate how they can see atmospheric perspective. Okay. Because we're working with atmospheric perspective, one key thing to keep in mind is that we're not working with architecture. Okay, this is really, really important. Now, atmospheric perspective refers to the effect of the atmosphere has on the appearance of objects when you look at them from a distance. You see objects further back in distance clearly, and their colors change in value, saturation, and hue. Hue meaning color. Pierre Bernard is a great example of this. This is an artist who sort of uses great sort of use of atmospheric perspective dictated in this painting titled The Palm, located in the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. You can see from the background, the haziness or the temperature of the background is a lot cooler. And the objects in the foreground, as well as the architecture and the foliage of the palm trees and the, uh, and the trees, are a lot more saturated, much more warmer. Intuitively, I want everybody to sort of realize how we can start to see atmospheric haze or also atmospheric perspective and the ways we sort of dilute our ink with water. Because of this, a good example would be to sort of analyze our photographic reference. Now, these are three key things I want everybody to sort of keep in mind. Your background of your image, right? So it's a lot cooler. This is just an image I just found on Google. Your middle ground, which is sort of between the background and the foreground. And lastly, the foreground. Now, atmospheric perspective creates the impression of the atmosphere between the viewer and the subject, also known as aerial view, meaning how it refers to the way the atmosphere influences the way we see distant objects. 
As things get further away, they appear smaller and lose detail, becoming similar and uh, uh, simpler and flatter forms. Now, because of this, we have to sort of look at this almost as a sort of color theory approach. Things that further away are a lot cooler and duller, and they lose saturation. They lose the richness of color. Things in our foreground are hotter, warmer, much more detailed, much more recognizable. We could read what this sort of nooks and crannies of this base of this tree is, right? Between that is the range that you can kind of dictate to sort of see how far, but also how light and how cool a color could be. Now, because we haven't gone into color theory yet, we're only going to be working with a uh, achromatic grayscale, which is a sort of a valley range from lightest from one end and then darkest on the other end. Because of this, we will, will we actually be manipulating our ink with water, ideally as our prime medium that we're going to be using with the ink. <clears throat> Really, part of this is sort of recognizing how we see the use of space, but also the use of positive and negative space. Now, Frank Miller's sort of series of Sin City's American comic book uh, genre is a sort of great example of really exaggerating that high contrast of black and white. Areas of interest are obviously positive space. Areas of negative interest are sort of have a sort of less uh, information to worry about in our subjects are negative space, but depending on our subjects. Now let's talk a little bit about those specifically in detail. Space refers to the emptiness or the areas between, around, above, below, or within objects. Positive shapes are the shapes or forms of interest, right? Negative space are the empty spaces between the shapes or forms. Now positive space refers to the objects or the subject of areas and interest in an artwork such as a person's face or a figure in a portrait, uh, and objects in a still life painting or trees in a landscape painting. Negative space is the background or the areas that surround the subject of the work. Now, I want also to, uh, everybody to sort of think about how we can manipulate our sort of ideas of positive and negative space. How, what how would happen if you flipped it on 180? The Day and Night sort of series done in 1938 by M.C. Escher is a great example of this. The use of positive and negative shape is sort of fantastically sort of designing a sort of not only surrealist landscape, but also sort of areas in which you, um, things can sort of almost change their actual physical form to another form itself entirely. Throughout this process, when we're looking at these references, what I want everybody to keep in mind is that we're not just working with a traditional quote unquote landscape. Landscapes can be political. And specifically, if we're looking at artists like Kara Walker, so, so sort of the ideas of what we think about slavery from the history of the United States. Beyond this is sort of thinking of how simple but also sort of powerful some of these silhouettes can sort of articulate this message of our history of the past in the U.S., but also sort of the traumas and then sort of the horrors of slavery's um, past history. Through this, I want everybody to sort of keep in mind that when you're looking at history and specifically looking at a political landscape, this can be also explored in this assignment. Part of, part of this journey is sort of identifying what we look at in terms of not only fields of interest, but also sort of inspiration. What is inspirational to you? And that could be a variety of things. Hideo Kojima's sort of series of Metal Gear Solid done in sort of in the early 1960s to actually to, to our present day, to even till today, is a sort of great example of looking at the use of positive and negative space. Throughout his concepts and his sort of illustrations from his uh, artworks, from his uh, major series of games that he creates in Japan and, and, and as well as abroad, is a sort of looking at the ways in which we see harsher but also thinner lines with our ink. Notice what I want everybody to keep in mind is that you don't have to make a complete outline of your composition. You can really use the use of positive and negative space by really factoring in the background itself. Guaiji is a great artist when we're thinking about history, but also sort of the philosophies and the sort of ideas of the three teachings from the East, which is sort of thinking about Buddhism or Taoism or Confucianism, 
And specifically, if we're looking at this large painting from the Northern Song Dynasty titled Early Spring, this is a sort of great example of showcasing the development or the strategy of depicting a multiple perspectives called the angles of totality. And he says that because a painting is not a window, there is no need to sort of imitate the mechanics of, a, of vision and view as seen from only one spot. Part of this is sort of looking at it from different angles. And this is why it's really important when we look at landscapes from specifically China and Japan and beyond, it's a really different interpretation of the, of the natural world in terms of learning from nature, but also sort of thinking about how we read a landscape rather than visually just looking at something. The brushstroke in Chinese painting is less the a means of applying ink than a philosophical or emotional statement. Zen Buddhism and Confucianism are each associated with differing brushstroke styles and methodologies, meaning that a mark can really be much more impactful than an actual sort of value scale, depending on your subject, depending on your perspective. I want everybody to sort of keep this in mind when you're working in this process, because we'll really not only test your patience, but really I want everybody to learn how, how do we use ink? What are the sort of properties, the approaches that artists from the past, and specifically from the Northern Song dynasties like Gua Zhi himself, have used in order to create the sort of approach of looking at nature as their uh, main interest. He's one of the pioneers of what we think about in terms of Chinese landscape paintings, but actually a godfather to ink in general. Mai Lin, Listening to the Wind, is another great example of showcasing artists sh really showing and focusing on small, visually closer and more intimate scenes, while the background was often depicted as lacking of detail as a realm without substance or concern for the viewer or the artist which means that further away objects should be duller, less detail, more uh, less saturated, right? More gray, more almost towards the uh, lighter values. Closer the objects are in terms of our foreground are richer, much more darker, much more saturated. Part of this is the process of looking at how does not only ink work, but what can you do to sort of push that atmospheric perspective away from the landscape? My Wan is another great example of this on the mountain path spring, autumn leaf during a, another sort of artist in the Song Dynasty in China, but also sort of showcases this great adaptation of movement, which is the path the viewer's eye takes through the work of art, often to focal areas. Such movement can be directed along lines, edges, shapes, and color within the work of art. Uh, this is an example of showcasing how we not only read the calligraphy, which is located on the top right, but also understand the seal of the name of the artist, but how in which the figure itself moves across the landscape itself. We see a lot of what? Negative space. This journey gives you this opportunity of not just filling in the entire landscape. The use of positive and negative space is very methodically considered within this aspect. What I want everybody to sort of use is try to hold back and start to see less of the landscape and sort of more use of atmosphere, depending on the subjects. Now, again, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier, but here are the main three teaching philosophies in the East, which is Confucianism, which is association or sort of an emphasis with an ethical choices, hierarchy and social order. Taoism, also known as the way, looks at nature and simplicity for spiritual guidance. And then Buddhism, specifically Mahayana Buddhism, now Theravada, seeks to understand existence and overcome suffering, death, and rebirth. Baba Shanren is another artist from the sort of really fascinating approaches in the uh, late Ming dynasty to sort of see how and which on the man of the eight greats, lotus and ducks, the sort of vertical sort of space of the ducks looking upright from their actual space. Notice the subtlety of their silhouettes. They're done with multiple, not uh, or see, like, individual strokes but the sort of in a sort of simplified way abstraction is your best friend throughout this process see how in which by smudging by moving the brush evenly back and forth side to side make a series of strokes make a series of marks what how how that can actually be resembling shadows value texture a stem a tree a mountain path a forest so on and so forth. 
the more you start to see how quickly but how efficiently ink can be used are sort of looking at the sort of things of we sort of avoid, meaning in terms of the West, we focus too much on the details. And the East, they're more really sort of focused on other sort of approaches that are far beyond our sort of comprehension when we're looking at something as simple as a landscape. This is a tendency, but also sort of a focus that everybody who has a sort of a general idea of, you know, having too much control will test that sort of patience, will really look at yourself in terms of reflecting how can we read the landscape itself. Now, Rembrandt is another great artist during the sort of Baroque period in the Netherlands, who also uses more sort of etchings as well as his drawings, as well as ink, and incorporates some of his works of art. A lot of these are sort of studies and sort of almost preliminary drawings that he uses, but also is a great example of seeing how we can sort of manipulate, but also kind of exaggerate some of our inks on these foregrounds as well as the backgrounds, even from figuration. And I want everybody to remember that part of this is really use of the water itself, but also not all of sort of overworking the drawing during this um, assignment. Now, Hokusai is another great artist in Japan who uses a sort of series of woodblock prints and specifically 36 views of Mount Fuji to sort of see how in which he studied and analyzed the landscape itself from his own artistic perspective. Now, the title itself, also known as The Wave, was actually under the wave off of Kanagawa specifically. And you can kind of see here, there's sort of series of boats from these fishermen that are trying to cross over the actual um, water. Ikue, which translates to the pictures of floating worlds, is a genre of Japanese art which flourished from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Its artists produced woodblock prints and paintings of such subjects as female beauties, kabuki actors, sumo wrestlers, scenes from history, folk tales, traveling scenes, and landscapes, flora, and fauna. It's quite remarkable to sort of see how in which graphic this image is, but also sort of how powerful nature can sort of overcome mankind itself within the sort of perspective of focusing on Mount Fuji in the background all the way that distance. Again, we talked a little bit about ideas of political landscapes. Chen Zhaozi is an artist from China who uses or created over 150 ink drawings of historic photos from major events in China from uh, 1909 to 2009. He then turned the drawings into a three-minute video of modern Chinese history as the clock ticks and the musical score. Now, this is on rice paper, which is a common material used all over the East because it's actually really helpful, but also sort of absorbs water beautifully in terms of ink washes. When we think about a landscape, especially with our global economic sort of climate today, than the US. It's also interesting to sort of see what we look at in terms of a political landscape. What does that physically or visually mean in the context of ink? I want everybody to also sort of uh, keep in mind that these drawings really showcase a variety of ways in which protesting and sort of opposing the communist governments in China showcase the sort of uh, humanism, the sort of the aspects of everyday life not only from the East, but also what everyday people do um, when they sort of wake up in the morning to sort of see how their country is being uh, or is treating their citizens in a different part of the world. I want everybody to factor this in when you're starting to think about those ideas, but also sort of use what you can sort of learn from, from these artists. Now, this is Toba Qaduri's work of art and specifically using sort of more density within sort of her process of creating her own paper, but also sort of in a working on a larger scale, really showcasing the density of this sort of the smoke clouds that are sort of um, on the top half of the actual work of art. This is another great example of use of, uh, again, positive and negative space, highlighting where the light is emulated from, from the direct center, kind of like we're in a cave or sort of a really dark room, could be a camera obscura looking out to the physical space. Now let's talk a little bit about materials. Now remember, on our supply kits, we have sort of two brushes, one small, one large, that you uh, you are should be able to use throughout this process. We are not working with graphite. We are not working with um, pencil or um, actually even charcoal. I want everybody to get in that habit to be working with our 
uh, Sumi inks as well as only our brushes only. And again, this is just familiarizing everybody with this process. But really, if we can follow these steps, this will actually help you tremendously when you're working from home. Now, taping all four sides of your paper on a flat surface will be extremely helpful because this Trafmore paper itself is not heavy enough, meaning it's not like watercolor paper. It's not strong enough to hold too much water. If you add and apply a lot of ink as well as water, the paper starts to buckle and bow. So keep this in mind. I also recommend everybody to have a scrap sheet of paper right next to you. You could use the back sheet of a paper, an older drawing that you want to either get rid of. You could use, sort of use as a scrap. And part of this is sort of as a testing sort of surface before you apply it on your actual sheet of your final drawing. Now we have our India inks and our Sumi inks. We're going to be sort of testing out to sort of see which one's sort of useful throughout this process. Those of you who have your supply kits, you should have your Sumi ink available in the green container. I have some of the India ink as well. The India is actually pretty useful, but it's a, a bit more cooler in terms of its color saturation. The Sumi ink is much more natural. It's actually made out of soot, which is a sort of a natural material from the earth, but also sort of used uh, for you know, thousands of years to sort of create uh, ink wash landscapes. Um, a roll of paper towels are also sort of vital in this assignment. A large cup or of clean water is a good sort of touchdown to sort of place all your brushes in while you're working. And then finally, up to three or four or even five containers of water so you can sort of dilute and sort of add each drop to your containers. We'll get into this a little bit more in detail throughout this process when we talk a little bit about the materials in the demo. But another sort of approach I want everybody to keep in mind is the sort of the per the purpose itself is the aspect of wet on wet or dry on wet approaches. Now, wet, wet on wet means that the wet ink is applied on wet paper or added to as a wash of fresh uh, wet ink. Dry on wet simply uh, means that you're applying wet ink onto dry paper or wet ink onto an area of dry ink, okay? This is really important because it really sort of dictates to sort of see what sort of bleeds, but also value scale you want to want to use. Here are kind of examples of what you, you can kind of see here, how the edges are much more sort of looser, but also sort of spread out and sort of bleed over around these edges. So they're not harsher lines like the one here from dry on wet. Now bleeds is a sort of another sort of approach. Excuse me. This is where it's sort of when you add a layer of thin water over your drawing, covering the entire sheet of paper, then add one drop of the ink onto the wet area. The ink will start to bleed and then move all over your paper. By moving the ink around with your fresh, with your brush, excuse me, you can experiment with different effects and value. This will vary because again, you do not want to fight with gravity but you also want to be really careful how you can control the area of the brush moving across the surface of the paper, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the demo. Now your station should really sort of look like this, ideally um, creating a value scale is completely up to you. You do not have to, but again, I highly recommend it if you would sort of want to practice. Um, I always like to kind of go to like Chipotle or any other restaurant that have those sort of small to go little containers and sort of ask for a few of them which I can kind of get with some lids. I can kind of store them away. And what you want is sort of a series of drops. You could do one, two, three, four, five, however many, and have a whole range of value. Because if you apply your series of layers over your actual drawing, wait for it to dry in you know, each step, you actually then can go back and add, add more and more darks. The rule of thumb is to add light to dark meaning the lightest area of the painting or the actual work of art should be really light already. We could use tape or we can use other sort of approaches, but really one thing to keep in mind is if you mess up, we cannot go back. Talk a little bit more about that in the demo. Now, we are going to be making four time preliminary drawings. Okay. Throughout this process, again, before starting your final drawings, we'll be using blue painter's tape, create four separate squares onto a drawing paper pad, dividing them into four squares, and we're gonna be timing ourselves, the same thing we, we did for our still life. Now, the rule is your first one should be really light. This is one drop, 
of ink, just one. It should it should look really, really light, okay? The next sort of drawing, three to four, should be two drops. The third should be three drops, and the last fourth one will be four drops with the same container, okay? Keep this in mind. You're just adding a drop at a time. And, this is, and I'll actually put this in the practice in the demo, okay? You will be submitting this with your actual final drawing assignment in about two weeks. So keep this in mind. Now, here's a uh, photograph I just found off of Google from Princess Mononoke, uh, directed and created by Hayao Miyazaki from Studio Ghibli, one of my favorite movies of all time. And what I want everybody to also remember is that you can use any reference to your choosing throughout this assignment. Good rule of thumb would be to sort of dictate again, but also sort of see how and which, which orientation will work best for your reference. Obviously, this is in the landscape. Now, for the sake of the demo, what I did is sort of make my image a lot wider, which taped the edges a lot shorter from top to bottom, two inches on top and then two inches on the bottom, but then I have one inch on both left and right sides. I also added a sort of value scale to show to showcase how in which we sort of see the darkest range from one side to the opposite, which will be the white, right? Now, since we don't have white ink, the whitest of my paper should be my brightest. I need to map that first, but also sort of dictate where that will be before I add my first ink. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the demo. Now, again, those of you who've used the grid before, if you would like to apply it for this assignment, you are more than happy to, you are encouraged to, by all means, it's completely up to you. It is optional. I repeat, it is optional. So keep this in mind. If you would like to freehand your composition, by all means, you can do that as well. Okay. I will leave that up to you. Now, let's look at some examples throughout the lecture. Now, this also gives us an idea of what students have done throughout previous quarters. Now, this is one from Mount Rainier that a student did in about an hour, if I'm not mistaken. I'll kind of just move over here and kind of see. And this gives you an example of what students can uh, use, but also sort of change within their reference. Like they notice there's a figure here that they sort of took out, but this is what you're going to be submitting for preliminary time drawings, well photographic doc, uh, photographic reference, and then a completed ink wash. Let's keep going. This is one from House Moving Castle. Again, you can use any subject to your choosing. Here's another example of a student sort of uh, landscape, but I always like to say, please keep it simple. These, this is actually a great example of using tape. Now, tape is your best friend. The reason why is when you're mapping and sort of really strategizing how your composition is going to look, if you want to make some marks to so sort of cover or sort of not let the ink bleed over certain areas, I would recommend using tape. Okay. Now, you can use tape anywhere throughout your drawing. It's completely up to you, right? You could use it to direct light to highlight objects, to remove some of the sort of darker areas so you won't have to worry about sort of going over it again and again. It's completely up to you. This is one sort of divided in a triptych, showcasing a love story between two figures. You can notice here, if you were curious to sort of see where these spots were coming from and this sort of glow, this highlight around the planets, the artist actually incorporated compressed charcoal. Those of you who want to incorporate compressed charcoal with this process, by all means. Here are another two great, vastly different examples, but also showcasing ways in which we see perspective. Here is one from a palm tree. I believe this was somewhere in the West Coast. I forgot where it was, where the artist was standing up, was standing, lowering uh, their body down, facing up towards the actual work, which is really interesting. So looking up at the sky. Here, the artist actually wanted to sort of add another layer to this process. What I mean by that is that they came up to me and said, Ayad, can I use gel pen as a highlight over my ink wash? I have never heard of a gel pen. I've never used one myself. They showed it to me during class, and I said, you know what, why not? See how far you can use it for your assignment. And then they were able to create something like this. You can start to also sort of see, notice how white the moon is 
what they've done is sort of taped out the entire edges of the moon as a perfect circle to sort of not worry about where the tape will sort of be, but also where the light will be coming from. This is the, the Parthenon located in the Acropolis in Athens. And this was a student who was an architect major who wanted to use a more sort of approach to look at antiquity, specifically Greek sculptures, as well as Greek architecture. And a part of this is, again, this is really considered a perspectival space, right? Because it's dealing with perspective. We're looking at architecture. But really, because of sort of time, and as well as sort of the, the landscape itself, it's starting to decay from the location. And this is a great example of showcasing history from architecture, but as a landscape. This was a fantastic example of showcasing the time of the day during night, but also sort of the use of the light coming in from the lighthouse. The same student that was using gel pen from the other assignment also saw that they wanted to use this uh, the gel pen for their assignment. So they asked uh, each other, like, hey, can I use some of your gel pen? The other student was nice enough and actually allowed them to use some of the gel pen for the highlights of the water, but also sort of for the so the sky of the uh, the stars in the sky, which is pretty great. This was a scene, I believe this was from Skyrim, which is a sort of a great example of showcasing, again, another idea, another concept of something that not only from the, uh, the natural world, but other sort of genres of art, video games, movies, even music videos. I will leave that up to you. This is a scene from an underwater. I believe this was from a movie. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. This is a fantastic drawing of the artist wanted to use Whist uh, a landscape in Whistler, Canada, where they went on a ski trip and sort of came back with sort of uh, photo references, but they also wanted to showcase themselves in all three scales. This is them all the way back there really showcasing great value, but also sort of enormous space between the mountains. This is at, I think this was a student's uh, private garden that they wanted to use, but they also wanted to put in their cat in perspective, but also this one here on the right, showcasing a great uh, sort of rendition of uh, Yosemite Park in California. I believe this is a Kiki delivery, if I'm not mistaken, or I might be wrong. Another Miyazaki film. This is from Spirited Away, another Miyazaki film. Again, I encourage you to look at other genres of art and not only just sort of looking at naturalistic landscapes from the internet. You may decide whichever, however, you would like to use your reference. You can incorporate other references, like you can add two references into one, but really it makes it much more complicated. So I always say, Please keep it simple. This is the perspective. I think this was somewhere in UW, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere near the water. I forgot exactly where it was. A student of mine was taking a class, was a student there, but also took my class uh, during the pandemic. This is my neighbor Totoro, which is another great example of showcasing vertical height, but also sort of the minuteness of scale. And finally, this is a great example of showcasing atmospheric haze from the fog that comes forth within the landscape, but also using the tape as these angles, a series of diagonals, right? To showcase where the light is coming through from the sun. Now you will be submitting four preliminary time drawings, well-documented photographic reference, and then your completed ink wash landscape drawing online with three submissions. Okay. Here's another great example of a student's uh, landscape uh, but also sort of an urban landscape of Seattle's construction sites uh, located in downtown. What questions do we have?